Hi. Hey, is is Grant on yet? Uh, yeah, I'm up here. Can you hear me? Oh, hey, Grant. Hey, Grant, we got you. Nice to meet you. Oh my God. Great, we'll get started in like one minute. Is there room for ambient chit chat in the meantime, or is this one of those like everyone stays stage silent until things go? We generally have more chit chat. I'm actually surprised. It's like a ghost town in here. Do you have any fun facts? <laughs> oh, geez, I need a better prompt to specify. <laughs> all right, I got. I got one. What, what, what's your uh, spirit animal? <laughs> spirit animal. Well, okay. So there was like a, a group of friends I had. This is this is going to be a disappointing non-answer. Um, <laughs> there was a group of friends I had in college where. My brother just started going by Tomcat. Like his name is John, but he just decided he was going to be Tomcat. And it's like stuck with that to the to this day. Like his bosses call him that. Um, and the other like members in our friend group were like, oh, we, we should have animal names. And like we called one of them Walrus because he just ate a lot, which in hindsight maybe is offensive, but he, he seemed to lean into it. And then another one was Polar Bear. Um, and there was like Lemur and just a lot of different like animal names that that's just what we actually call each other, like more, more so than their actual names. But somehow in the mix, because my brother was named Tomcat, my like spirit animal became Tom Kitten, which was just often abbreviated to TK, which I can then maybe imagine stands for something slightly less, you know, <laughs> uh, demeaning. But I feel like the the most honest, if like demeaning answer to spirit animal is a Tom Kitten, whatever the heck that would mean. I love that. That's a great story. Awesome. So let's get started. Well, Grant, I just want to say welcome to Hack Club. We are so excited and it is such an honor to have you with us today. Um, I want to introduce you to your Hack Clubber host, uh, who is Damien. Damien, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yes, hello. I'm Damien. I'm currently a sophomore at San Fernando High School. I've been the member, I've been a member of the Hack Club community for three years now. Uh, getting people interested in math is no easy task, but you, Grant, you quite literally pioneered it as an art form online. I know so many people, including myself, uh, that have you to thank for not just tremendous help on understanding complex mathematical ideas when we need it, but getting us interested and staying interested in math and the countless ways of ways through which it enhances the beauty of the natural world. Uh, we have 40 minutes and we're greatly excited and honored to hear from you, Grant. No, that's an exceedingly warm introduction. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I'm I'm happy to be here. It's fun to get to know you guys a little bit and happy to answer whatever comes to mind. Uh, so to uh, begin with a few preliminary questions, uh, could you please tell us a story of when you were the age of a modern hack level? So like uh, junior high school, high school, teenagers in general, um, hmm. and uh, moreover, uh, would you say that you were as fascinated with math as you currently are right now, or did that passion mature in you, develop in you later on? Oh, yeah, let's see. So I guess that would be, if I'm trying to picture myself as a sophomore in high school like yourself, um, you know, I, I, I was definitely really into math at that point. And I think for a long time, it's sort of like self-identified as liking the subject, um, maybe for kind of impure reasons at first, you know, like when you're little, math is just this thing in school. And so the, the only two relationships you can have with it is that like you get good grades or you get bad grades. Uh, like maybe more so these days, there's some notion of like aesthetic beauty and seeing that there's like an art form out there or whatnot. But I liked it probably because of the positive feedback loop, if I'm being honest. But then you you get yourself to the point where you can like, you know, work on puzzles that are, are fun. And then you, you realize like, hey, this has nothing to do with school, but I'm just kind of having fun with it. Um, so I... I went to like uh, uh, Park City High School. So Park City is this town in Utah that if people know it, it's often because they went there to ski sometime or the Sundance Film Festival. Um, it was just like a normal high school. Uh, but every year uh, they would take us to like the state math contest. So Utah would have this like math contest. And I was otherwise not super engaged with like the contest math scene. Like I later learned that there's like national contests, like the AMC and the Amy and like all this stuff. But up until later high school, I was sort of blissfully unaware of those. Um, but starting in like eighth or ninth grade, they, they would take us down to the state math contest, which I, I remember finding really fun because 
again, you have that kind of positive reward, but also just the problems themselves are really interesting. Uh, and I don't know if it was my sophomore year, but this is maybe why it came to mind when you, you mentioned that. I think it was around then. I had just like ambiently been thinking about, um, I think, factorials and uh, just a question of like how many zeros are at the end of a factorial it was like a surprisingly answerable question. Um, and whatever year it was, it was like 2008 or something like that. I remember thinking, oh man, contests love to do this thing where they'll have some like, the, the, use the year as a number in some kind of problem. I was like, oh, maybe they should do one that's like, how many zeros are at the end of 2008 factorial? I thought it was kind of like suitable for that. And I just like wrote a random cold email to the, um, who I thought was maybe in charge of that contest. Never heard anything back. Um, but then I, in that year's contest, I remember it was like, you know, there's 50 questions or something like that. And like one of them was this thing that I said, and maybe it was by coincidence, but I'm pretty sure it's because I had like uh, mentioned it. And that was just such this moment of like, wow. I can inf influence like what thing goes out to all the other kids in the state just by like thinking of some question and putting it there. Um, Cause I don't, I mean, the nice thing about hack club or something where you're engaged with like computer science and whatnot is you can make a thing that then clearly like people can touch and, and play with in some way. And like math is sort of a much more personal endeavor than that for a while. I mean, until you're doing like collaborative research or something, but for, for a large part, it's like, the joy that you get out of it is just something that you yourself experience. And then maybe whatever friends are around you who will tolerate you, like waving your hands and jabbering at them about Julia sets or something like that. But uh, it, it was maybe the, the first moment of something that was akin to like, you know, hey, this, this, this touches other people in, in, in some way. It was a contrived environment, but still, uh, that's what it came to mind. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, factorials. Uh, I know a few people myself that really enjoy uh, such that a uh, number theory was uh, really what got them into math. And also those types of problems where you have to deal with these large numbers, uh, like the vectorial of some incredibly large number. And as you said, those problems, you are dealing with these gargantuan numbers, but you're using uh, the beautiful tools, the beautiful toolbox that math grants us, we were able to discover how tangible they are and how inquiry can really get us places if we just think about the conceptual tools that we're using. So on that, was or were there, if we were to get a little more specific, a key problem, a key person, a key mathematical topic, or we've already talked about pictorials, uh, that really cemented the idea that math and math education is what you wanted to pursue? Um, you know, I don't know if there was ever anything so specific as that, where it's like, you know, one moment. And before that moment, I was like, I don't know about math education after I was into it. I think like I sort of enjoyed it just ambiently for a while. I mean, I will say there was a very influential calculus teacher I had who, um, I had for, he basically taught at my school for like two years. And I was lucky enough that like the two years I had calculus happened to be when he was there. Um, and he was one of these who, uh, like sort of made an effort to try to show students what was beyond just like in the class itself. Um, so I've noticed that he would also like make sure that in his schedule, whatever the most like remedial math class in the school was, like he would make sure that he was teaching that. But then he also really liked to teach sort of the more advanced ones for the kids that were like into academics. So he, he liked to sort of straddle both of those ends. Um, and because I was, you know, kind of nerdy and I, and I enjoyed the subject, I would often just like maybe ask him some more questions after class. And then because he was clearly amenable to that, I would like ask some more and more. Um, and he, he would just like share these things where, uh, you know, you just kind of think of, think of it as such a linear thing in school at first. It's like, oh, you take like algebra one, then algebra two, and then geometry. And it's like, there's this line. And maybe that was the first moment where he starts talking about all this other stuff that makes it feel like this tree with a bunch of branching. And he um, told me about like other places that I could go to learn more about things. So there was this uh, a group of, at the University of Utah, uh, like that, um, it was a math circles event. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with like math circles um, and the like, but so I certainly had been like unfamiliar with that. And I was like, oh, cool. There's just like, I guess some other kids around my age will like come and we just learn about totally random seeming bits of math. And because it was at the University of Utah, um, the, there was actual like mathematicians who would talk rather than just like math teacher. And I think maybe that was the first time that it was clear that mathematician was a thing. Uh, that there, there's people who just like do math as a living, um, not in the sense of like in the service of engineering or something, but that somehow that was a, a career in and of itself. 
Um, and so for me, that maybe that was this moment like, oh, wow, maybe I kind of want to do something in that vein. Um, and there was definitely lots of problems in, in that like seminar that sort of stuck out. Like, uh, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to flub on like the exact specifics, but I remember like one lesson about using roots of unity in the complex plane to solve like geometry questions where, you know, let's say you have, I, I give you some kind of Pentagon, um, and it's inscribed in a circle with a radius of one. Uh, and then I ask you, you know, you could ask various geometry questions like, Hey, what's the side length of that Pentagon? Um, or what's the length of, di of the diagonal or something like that. Um, and, uh, one, I think, I think the phrasing of the question was like, if you look at the two diagonals of this pentagon uh, and you multiply their lengths together, and then you also multiply that by, uh, well, let's, let's just say we take one diagonal and we multiply it by the length of one of the sides. Like, what is that value? And you might think to do that, you have to find like both the side length and the diagonal, and that's going to involve some like weird trigonometry. And maybe you need to know like the sine of 72 degrees off your head or something like that. But there's a, just a, a completely beautiful way of thinking about it. If you think of those numbers as being the roots of the polynomial Z to the fifth minus one. Um, and then if you uh, factor that polynomial, you can write it down as Z minus one times z to the fourth plus z cubed plus z squared plus z plus one, like any any of these uh, polynomials that look like z to some power minus one, you can always factor out because you know one of the roots is one. And then the rest of the roots um, exist somewhere in this other polynomial that's just got nothing but coefficients one. And so then if you ask something like, hey, what happens if you take this polynomial um, and you know in the factored form, it looks like z minus you know one of the roots times z minus another one of the roots on and on. And you ask what happens when you plug in a number like one? Well, when you look at it in terms of the coefficients, you can just see what it should be when you plug in one, because you know the, all the all the z to the sum power terms are are uh, just going to be equal to one. Whereas if you look at it in the factored form, it gives you this very non-obvious fact about like a product of a bunch of complex numbers that if you try to draw them out, it's basically the like geometric lengths associated with the pentagon. So you can kind of get clever and directly get at the answer to this, you know, what's the product of those two values, which of course was a question contrived so that you could use this cleverness. But, th but that connection, I mean, that was just sort of like this mind blowing thing like, oh, wow, okay, you've got this connection between like geometry and algebra and whatnot. Um, and it came up in this math circles event that, you know, very unlikely you're going to see that in a high school class. But the fact that it was something that was separated out just for the sake of just like teaching high school kids things that are at their level that, that they don't otherwise come up. Uh, you know, I think some accumulation of those made an impact such that by the time I was going into college, like it was pretty clear I wanted to major in math. And even if I didn't know exactly what path, like should I be a research mathematician uh, or, or something else, like the, some life path that included that was, was going to be part of it. Um, but math communication, I mean, that it's not, wasn't really, and kind of still isn't really like a clear career path in and of itself. Like usually it's like in the service of something else or like you're a research mathematician and you happen to engage a lot of outreach or something. So I don't think I would have had any way of like any moment to click into what I'm doing now, except for when I like stepped back and realized I was already doing it sometime. That actually, that actually kind of connects to uh, one last question I'd like to ask before we open up the floor. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, uh, before moving to uh, YouTube math education, you uh, did some work developing calculus curricula at Khan Academy, uh, the platform largely responsible for first transforming math and science into something that can be experienced purely online. Uh, I love Khan Academy. I'm sure many other people here too uh, do too. And so as we continue to embrace online education, especially in the face or uh, in the wake of COVID-19 and the you can learn anything mantra, how do you think the implementation of platforms like Khan Academy in modern education is going to evolve in the coming years and decades? You know, I really hope that it evolves in the direction of kind of the original mission, which was uh, the, like the, the intent of flipping a classroom um, is not one of saying like, oh, this is one step to pushing everything online. It's very legitimately saying like, hey, rather than having teacher time, um, allocated towards exposition, towards just explaining the thing to the students. Like you can get explanations in a very, very scalable way. Like explanation is actually not the hardest part of education. So that's the part that we should maybe like try to scale and instead let the teachers focus on the very non-scalable parts, which are, you know, actively engaging with a student, like meeting them where they are, like if they're struggling with some sort of exercise, maybe being able to in the moment um, help adapt with them. Uh, 
And I, and I think it, it's really hard to imagine like a truly online education that's fully that way and fully scalable that's still good. Like the, the versions that end up working well, it'll have some notion of more like one-on-one -on -one or like few to one um, online tutorials, maybe over Zoom or something like that. And maybe as, the, as that gets good enough, you can have it like online, but it won't be scaled in the way that like Khan Academy type things um, uh, are, are meant to scale. And in order for that to work, right, where you really have something where the place where the student gets their explanation is kind of decoupled from the time spent in the classroom, like you really have to change the normal dynamics of how classroom time is spent in a way that I think is, is logistically pretty hard. Um, you know, it's, if you're a teacher, it's actually a very comforting thing to be able to say, I've got these 40 minutes, I'm going to go through every student with every student, like the same basic kind of material in that time. Because if you have this fray of, hey, I assigned this lecture for you to watch last night, and we're going to be doing like, um, you know, homework related to it right now, or like, have you write your essays related to it right now, and everyone's doing their own thing. It's like, how do you know if people actually wrote the, uh, watch the lecture? How do you choose which uh, little groups you tend to during that 40 minutes? Um, like if someone is stuck, by what mechanism do you learn that they're stuck? Uh, if someone's just like totally coasting along, like how do you, uh, how do you recognize that? Basically because all those questions become harder, I feel like the, the role that, I don't know, technology has to play in like pushing education forward there should be to like try to sit in the classroom and address all those logistical questions more so than the really enticing stuff, which is how do you scale explanation? And like, I can just happily live in my world where, you know, I like make YouTube videos and the whole thing is centered around in some sense, like scaled explanation. But if I'm really, I don't know, critically honest with myself, that's a pretty separate thing from where the hard challenges of like modern education or getting education to be able to work when it's online actually lie. A lot of that has to do with like, I, I just have no idea how to solve those problems. Um, but I would hope that, you know, where the future is going is one where the talented people spend their time thinking more about those than they do necessarily about the like fun to think about problems of, of like I said, scaling explanation. But yeah, we can see. It's fascinating. So um, now I think it's about that stage in the AMA where it's fair to open the floor up to questions. We already have a number of people with their hands up. So Ishan, would you like to go first? Also, if you'd like, uh, please feel free to introduce yourself and where your hack club is if you're currently leading one. Uh, sure, I'm Ishan. I'm, um, uh, I'm in Seattle, Redmond. Uh, I love math. It's beautiful. And I say that to my classmates and they often think that it's a strange thing to say that math is beautiful. So sometimes um, uh, to get people interested in math, uh, sometimes I sh try to walk them through um, that infinite series where it goes one plus one by two plus one by four plus one by eight dot dot dot. And then mm -hmm. you try to add, add them all up as an infinite sum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer comes out to be two. It's finite. You're adding infinitely many numbers and the answer is finite. So that, that blew my mind when I was in eighth grade. Um, and I watched a number file video. You must know number file, right? Of course. That was fantastic. Yeah. So, well, three blue, one brown is also fantastic. Yeah. And that's how I uh, started learning calculus. Uh, so I, I try to show them uh, the one plus one by two thing. And uh, I walk them through um, the, the visual proof, which is where you have the square divided into halves, right? Mm -hmm. And then I also show them the algebraic proof. And then I try to generalize it so that um, you have series like 1 by 3 plus 1 by 9 plus 1 by 27. What happens mm -hmm. if you add them all up, right? So I just generalize the, the, the formula for that. Um, and then later I try plugging in um, numbers that shouldn't work, like minus 1. Mm -hmm. And the answer comes out to be like a half. With, even though the series actually doesn't converge, if you actually write it out with minus 1, Mm -hmm. The answer that the formula gives you is kind of sensible. So that, that also blew my mind. Uh, it gives out the answer a half or a minus half, depending on whether you plug in one or one, one by two. Right? Yeah, you're not alone being mind blown by that, by the way. I feel like this is yeah. a thing that, yeah, like you see so, in like Euler's notes, uh, various things with divergent sums that don't make sense, but that he like writes down some kind of value for. So it's like trying to come to terms with in what way can this make sense. I, like I think that's a delightful exploration. That, that's pretty incredible. And then sometimes I uh, I try proving that 0.99 repeating is equal to one. So that also blows my mind. 
um what what kind of things would you um show people who who are not used to the idea that math is beautiful how would you show them that math is beautiful yeah i mean well you just gave a couple of excellent examples there um i mean if if let's say we were to just jump off of the exploration that you're describing there you know i think the idea of infinite sums and whether they converge can definitely capture a lot of imagination um what, like you know i think one of the the most fun things there is that you say uh okay is it the case that just because the terms are getting smaller and smaller does that mean the the, the sum will necessarily converge um and really digging into the example of 1 over n where it's like 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 yeah, the harmonic series um, yeah like the harmonic series i mean there's so many interesting ways that you can go with that first of all showing that it diverges and like the way that you do it you kind of have this comparison the one by two things right Mm -hmm. Yeah, you like yeah. you you chunk them in the appropriate ways, and you say, "Hey, based on how we group these, it looks like uh, things can always um, uh, it, there's there's a series that we know diverges that looks like one plus one plus one plus one that sits underneath it, so it pushes it up. But then you can ask, how quickly does it grow? And you can try to come to the <laughs> idea that it's around the natural log of n, and that like really justifies why we call it the natural log to some extent. But, the, but there's a little difference, and that little difference seems to approach a constant, and it's the special constant of nature called the you know, Euler's constant, but Euler has too many things named after him. Um, you can, I, I actually watched a beautiful video the other day um, for the summer of math exposition contest we did this summer talking about if you take this harmonic function where you like add up the first n values for one over n, could you extend that to real numbers? You know, if you, if you define h of n to be, you know, one plus one half plus one third on and on up to one over n, at first it doesn't seem sensible to have like h of 3.5 or h of 3.75 but can you, is there a sensible way to do it? And, you know, this video gives a really beautiful, you know, explanation of uh, a way that you might do that. Um, you know, in your, how do you extend things to make these other values sensible? One of the most, um, the videos that I've put out that's probably got the most hate because I, it was early on and I didn't know what I was doing. I was talking about how- uh, Minus one by 12, is that it? It, it wasn't quite that number file did a one on that that got a similar amount of unjustified hate, but it was <laughs> in a similar vein where if you take one plus two plus four plus eight, where they're, they're positive powers of two, which obviously blows up to infinity. But there's like, if you just apply this like formula that you're describing, it seems like that formula would pump out negative one. It's like, okay, well, it doesn't apply because it's not a convergent series. But is there any way that it's negative one? And the sort of two completely different senses in which you want this sum to be negative one, one is in terms of like, this thing called analytic continuation with complex analysis. And another is in terms of a totally different metric that you put on like rational numbers. And this is all to say like using something like what you described as a starting point to say, hey, there's this really nice trade-off between if you want to make sense out of something and then you, you kind of try to ask like, is it useful to the world? Like if you just say, hey, this divergent thing converges because of analytic continuation, that's not helpful. But if you try to say, hey, analytic continuation is this thing in complex analysis, and complex analysis as a whole is this incredibly useful field for like such and such reasons. You know, I think later in life, I started to care a lot more about that. When I was like a high schooler, I was just happy. I didn't care if things were applied or not, but I've learned like a lot of other people care if they're applied. So like every, every time that you do these explorations where it feels like you're sort of inventing stuff um, to make it work, if possible, try to like draw a little thread to, to where it like helps you build something. Um, a long winded answer, but it's, it's essentially just saying like, uh, the, the very thing that you were describing has uh, flowering on top of it, like so many different things that I think kind of capture the beauty that you're asking about. Yeah, but I'll, exactly. I'll quit pontificating it and uh, go on to the next question from, I guess, BJM. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ishan. Uh, so uh, BJM, would you like to go? And also feel free to introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name is Byungjin. I am a hack clever from Vancouver, Canada. Um, I first saw your videos while learning on machine learning and like, I think it was neural networks. Um, I read, I mean, I, I went through all of your videos. I also went through your videos on like Khan Academy, on like multivariate calculus. Um, so it's really cool to have you here. Um, I had a question. It's like, as someone that's more or like less interested or just, I don't know, less talented in math. I find mastering math concepts really hard. So how, like, what's your strategies or what's your framework on mastering those concepts? Because your content definitely spans over so many fields, right? Like machine learning or math in general. Um, yeah, so I was just curious how you um, master those. 
Yeah. I, so first of all, I mean, the, the framing of, it's very easy to kind of think of there being like, oh, some people are good at math or talented at math and like some have it and don't. I, I really do think it's just a matter of time spent on it. But but the answer to your question would be like, what does it look like for it to be productive time? I think that it's really easy to accidentally find yourself just watching videos or just like reading notes or watching lectures and not really solving problems. And this is maybe a cliched thing. It's like, oh, you've got to act, actively do like practice and solve problems. But it, but it really does matter for like building up your intuitions where there's these sort of ineffable patterns that when you come to understand something else, it's because you you came to recognize a pattern in the service of like solving something else. And I actually think computer science and like building things ends up being a really good ground for solving those kinds of problems. Like I'll, I'll give you an example actually here, which is I um, was recently working on a video about like the unsolvability of the Quintic, which is this result about how we've got like a quadratic formula and a little bit lesser known cubic formula, and then a god awful quartic formula to solve degree four polynomials. But you actually can never have a quintic formula. Um, and there's this like interesting reason why. And in the service of creating like an illustration for this, um, there was one uh, basically, I, I needed a little program. I, I can even like pull it up now potentially, but like a program where you actually, I will do that because rather than waving my hands, um, it'll be, can I share my screen? Well, if a host enables me to share my screen or something, but where you can tweak around the um, coefficients of a polynomial and then see what happens to its roots. And the whole explanation ends up centering on um, like ways that those roots get shuffled as you like move around your coefficients. Now, this was all just like in the service of explaining one thing. And I was coming to better understand that one thing, but just to implement that um, tool required just a good way to like go from the coefficients of a polynomial to the roots. I'm like, oh, well, given that it's unsolvable and like some constraints into the word unsolvable, like what's the way to do this? And there's a bunch of other root finding methods. And one that you might learn about in calculus is something called Newton's method. Um, and I basically just ended up in this rabbit hole of like, I, I sort of thought that like Newton's method is like simple and like, oh, it's this thing that kind of gets you closer to roots. But it's this really, really interesting rabbit hole if you let yourself go into it. And it was only in the service of like building something for it. And then I was like, oh, maybe I'll do a video about Newton's method and like the fractals that come about from it and like trying to explain some of that. And like the effort of trying to explain it and the effort of like building things around it just felt like a much more productive use of time than merely reading about it. It was like with this, this product end goal. And so if you find yourself like wanting to learn something and the first thing might be to ask, like, why is it that you want to learn it? And because if it's in the service of building something like outstanding, that's actually the, a good way to maybe learn it a little bit more deeply. And if it's not in the service of building something and you are like, you know, a hacker as, as part of being a member of this club, I assume, ask yourself if there is something that you can build in the service of like understanding it or explaining it to others or like justifying to yourself that it is kind of a useful thing. Not all math fits into that. Like sometimes you do just kind of want to drill on it. Like if you're learning calculus, there should be some point when you just like try to compute a whole bunch of integrals and you're not necessarily building something, but it, well, you're building your own intuitions about them, but it's, it's like, there, there is a time when you have to do that. And like even research level mathematicians, like spend their time drilling on stuff to learn the new things they need to for their research. So like, there's never a point when you're above that. Um, but in the times when you can build, I actually think that that's when it sinks in and you like remember it for years thereafter. Yeah. Thanks so much. so uh, we are actually a little past the uh, halfway mark. Um, thank you for, again, we are incredibly on uh, so honored to have you here, Grant. Um, so uh, next up, um, let's say, uh, unless you have a particular person in mind, yeah, it's, it's up to you. Hi. Is, is there a canonical order to who raised their hand first, or is that um, is that visible to me? I don't, I don't think there is. I've not been able to establish uh, where that is. I will call out random names then, if that's good for you. Let's go with Claire Wang. Oh, I was going to choose her anyway. So, oh, so thanks. Um, hi. Yeah. Um, so hi, I'm Claire. I am a love getter, and I've. I mean, I guess like I grew up on science YouTube. Like I love science YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's my obsession. And um, like I have to admit, I've watched videos a lot and I've fallen asleep to them and listened to the soundtracks for your videos as well. And as well as checked out Madam. So like, there's a little bit of obsession I have with science YouTube. But um, I think something I'm really interested in is like your path towards mathematical communication. 
And we see that a lot of people, a lot of scientists and also like non-scientists are really interested in such scientific communication. And I was just wondering, like, what was your path into deciding to do communication when you majored in mathematics, probably thinking you're going to do like research? And also what's like one of the most rewarding things about your YouTube or your communication? You know, the, the honest truth is I sort of stumbled into it where th there were a couple things through college where when there were circumstances to like tutor or to like give talks, um, like there was this one event that Stanford would do where uh, like high school students could come in and just like get lessons from the undergrad. So you could sign up as an undergrad to like give lessons. I oh, is it Splash? Called. Splash. Yeah. Okay. Splash. That's yeah. Me and Damon and some people went to MIT Splash actually. It was really cool. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, MIT has got a splash. Stanford has a splash. I don't know how common a thing it is, but um, like I, I would sign up to like teach things for that because uh, that was fun. Or um, like I, I did a fair bit of tutoring in that time. Um, but I, I don't, I don't know if it was, if you were to like probe me in that moment and say like, oh, is this like part of a long-term career ambition? I would have been like, I don't know, man, I'm probably going to be either a software engineer or a mathematician. Like, obviously you can't just give talks. Um, but I, I did want to, like, I did want to just try establishing some kind of footprint on the internet. I remember when I was leaving college thinking that I didn't have the most like long-term faith in the stability of the university system in comparison to the long-term faith I had in the like growth of the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. like if, you know, if you're like choosing a career, you're, you're making this like many decades long that, um, and I'm not saying like university assistants will collapse or anything like that, but in terms of is, are the job prospects there like growing or shrinking, it's just not entirely clear to me that it was like necessarily a grow growing kind of answer there, or is any kind of footprint on the internet, um, just seems like it would be beneficial because it like lives there permanently. And if you make something good, then maybe the, you can like point to that and as a portfolio and whatever other steps you want to take. So I was definitely thinking of it as like a thing that would be on the side, but that would maybe be helpful for random steps I wanted to take. So the, the very first such one was that um, Khan Academy happened to be looking for new content creators around the time that I was graduating. And I happened to be like in conversation with some of them and this like very stars aligning kind of thing. And so to have just like one or two YouTube videos that weren't great, to be honest, but to have something to point to, to say like, oh, this is a thing I'm in, like interested enough in that I'm like doing it anyway, regardless of whether it's like an official path or something. I think that that made it a lot more possible to then start something with them. And then that makes it a lot more possible to take further steps because then if I'm like talking to some other organization or something, I'm like, oh, I've like made a couple of these videos, but also I've been like working at Khan Academy. And like, if with each step you're sort of, I don't know, slightly anticipating where you want to be, and then you just sort of make it happen, or you just start doing it regardless if someone's paying you to do it or not, that kind of thing. Then I think all the people that I know that have walked into very strange career paths that like didn't exist before, that's the shape that it's had. Like before yeah, any notion really cool of it actually it being, right. yeah. Like so, so I don't know, Claire. For example, is is the spirit of your question one where you, you find yourself wanting to do such a similar path or something similarly? um unforged or is it more just a sideline hypothetical um yeah i was just really curious how someone could create their own career in a way that you have and a lot of people have and yeah i guess like your story of how it just you know it was somewhat serendipitous but also like fate you know sorry that's that's really interesting yeah i you know i, I realize i'm being a little bit long-winded with some of these answers but if i could just like abbreviate it would be if there's a thing you kind of want to be doing just start doing it like independent of if it's you know, the full-time thing that you're spending your time on, or if there's a legitimate title around it or anything that, you know, if you, it's a little bit like if you want to work for some startup um, and if they have any kind of open source projects, if you just like start contributing to their open source projects, like that gets, that gets their attention. Right. Um, or if you have some vague sense that like, oh, maybe I want to start a company that does X. It's like, maybe you just start building a prototype for X and like, see if it uh, resonates at all. Um, or if you want to be a writer, you don't, you don't like wait until you're trained to be a writer. You just like make sure that every day you spend a little bit of time like writing in some capacity, whether that's in a journal or a short story or something like the, just do the thing that you want to do in the long run immediately advice is kind of hard to overstate. I think, yeah. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. That, thank you. I, I think that's fantastic advice that I mean, is this commonplace in a lot of media? Work hard, work consistently, and you will achieve your ambitions. Um, 
but I mean, it, it's, it is a very valuable message, thing to keep in mind. You don't, there is nothing keeping you waiting from doing what you want to do, in most cases, at least um, in the absence of bureaucracy, uh, except yourself. So um, do you have anyone, anyone uh, in mind uh, for our next ask? Uh, I mean, th this will be totally arbitrary based on just who's sitting at the top of my screen, but um, maybe Joaquin Bandio Grandio. Hello. Oh, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Okay, so um, my name is Joaquin. I'm a Mexican hack clubber. And uh, I'm proud to say I'm a math nerd. So what I was trying to ask you is, how would you recommend someone to learn math on their own? Like when I was in high school, I tried to make this sort of mathematical research on differential geometry. And it was such a mess because like when I went into books, they were like super rigorous and you have like definitions and things that seem so odd, but then they make up like their arguments for why they work, but you get like no intuition. So mm. where can you find this intuition? So, okay, um, in general with the like, how to, how to learn things on your own, I, the, fo the answer should be like very people centric. So the perfect situation is where there's an actual mentor locally that you can find, you know, it's at a university, a teacher or something like that, that you can do as like an independent guided reading. Now, okay, maybe that's not available um, for whatever reason. If there's um, like a, a, a friend or a small group of friends that you would want to like read the things with. So, you know, if you're engaged with Hack Club, maybe there's other Hack Clubbers who are interested in differential geometry. And you say like, oh, every week, you know, we'll like try to read one chapter and then we'll kind of trade notes. I'm like, man, I found this part unintuitive. Did you? Oh, wait, no, the, the intuition there is if you just draw this picture and kind of getting that side of things. Um, but maybe that's not available. Other people aren't necessarily interested in like the exact same things. If you can find lectures, I, I, I personally tend to find this helpful where if I see, especially if it's the author of the book and they're like giving talks at all or have given some kind of lecture series that they like posted on YouTube, um, there's so many little things that are said while they're lecturing. It might still be kind of dry and rigorous, but you can have these things like, oh, you know, there's this little lemma, but you don't, you don't really need to worry about it. It's just like, uh, as long as we like take this through the thing that's actually um, like the important part here is such and such. And like all those little verbal cues about where your focus should and shouldn't be, I think shines through in a lecture that is hard to come through in a book. Um, but those, I don't know, those are sort of the three different tiers of like engaging with a human uh, uh, in, in doing the thing rather than just the text itself. Um, and the other one would be, uh, and I, I really wish that I had like, someone had told me this when I was starting my undergrad, uh, you don't have to read just that one book. Like actually the most important step when you're going through a text to learn some math is to choose the right book first. Um, so, you know, th there's probably a ton of people who have written things on differential geometry. Take a look at five of them. See if one of them resonates better than others, because odds are, you know, you kind of go through one and for whatever reason, it just doesn't kind of click with where you are. But maybe you see like Tristan Needham just wrote a book about differential geometry. And, you know, he had this pretty outstanding book on visual complex analysis that everyone who reads loves. Like maybe that one's just going to be better. And like making sure that you, you, you spend time on that choice phase of things, then it can save you a lot of time in the future on the reading side of things. Um, so... That's that's what I would try. And next, uh, only because he's sitting right next to Joaquin in my box, I'll go with uh, John Linz or Leans. Oh, it's it's Linz. Linz, okay. Cool. So hi, uh, I'm John. I'm a hack club leader at Northgate High School, which is uh, located in Northern California. And as someone um, compared to most of my hack club peers, who's really joined. Uh, well, math in general much later, um, it, it was very late. Uh, junior year, I was still in pre-calculus, uh, and I'm only just taking calculus now after uh, consulting Damien, who's, who's here on this call. Uh, and um, it was actually in a large part due to your videos. Um, I remember I was a little bit concerned because uh, with a lot of elementary math, um, such as uh, conic sections, for example, it's like, okay, well, 
it, it wasn't very interesting, but I, I stumbled across your conic section uh, video and I thought it was uh, very fascinating the way you laid it all out. And, um, you know, I, I went further and I watched all of like pretty much all of your videos. I watched the, all the calculus and all the linear algebra videos and even some of your multivariable calculus videos on Khan Academy. And um, uh, my, my question is, is for people like me uh, who really joined this level of math, which we don't see in elementary math, where math is almost a burden, um, what can I do uh, for, those, for those who are maybe not exposed to your videos, uh, not saved by grant, um, what can I, uh, what could we really do um, to help them see, you know, what, what's really after this uh, superficial um, level of math? Uh, well, I mean, maybe I can ask you, John, like, why is it that you wanted to learn the math in the first place? Like, a lot of people just don't even care and aren't even pushed into it. Was it because um, your friends were into it or a project that you were doing, a, a sense of like what 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 was it that like made you want to spend your YouTube hours on that or uh, rather than on like the millions of other things that it could have been? Well, I think one component would be uh, a lot of my projects, uh, programming projects in particular. Um, I didn't really realize this going into programming, but so much of it requires math, um, math that I didn't understand at first. And, uh, you know, I, I had used YouTube as a source. Uh, I used a multitude of different sources, but um, your videos were a source. For example, the, uh, as I mentioned, the multivariable calculus videos were great for uh, machine learning theory. Um, well, I think that actually, you know, gives a, a good part of the answer where, you know, I, I can't tell you the number of people I've talked to who uh, said that they didn't really like math through school, but because they were into programming, found themselves like backdooring their way into like needing to know uh, certain things about math. And so, you know, if you're saying like, what can we do to help other people get interested? You know, I, I don't think YouTube is the right place to start because you have to like start by being curious about it for some reason. You know, if, <laughs> if you just like took someone who didn't care about math and showed them one of my videos, I'm almost certain they would probably have a I mean, I, I do my, what I can to try to make it so that they don't have a terrible experience, but I, I don't necessarily know if it would click unless there was preceding it some kind of um, motivator. And so programming is a big one. Uh, you know, a, a lot of other sciences too, right? Like biology is just ripe with very interesting things. If you want to like get into genetics a little bit and then you realize like, hey, how do you find the relevant patterns like among genes in the right way? Or uh, if you want to know like, hey, is something that I'm seeing actually really unlikely such that it should be um, uh, explored further? Or is it like kind of decently probable? You have to have some instinct for like probabilities around that. And like I, most people, I think you're going to be able to find some science that they're like sort of interested in intrinsically. Um, like everyone here, maybe computer science did that for others. Maybe it's like, how does the world work with physics? But like maybe starting from that and then really trying to ask the like find the kind of questions that you can ask that are just really hard to answer without knowing some of the math in it you know like what why are why are um orbits ellip ellipses right why, why is that the shape that a planet traces when it goes around the sun like that's just a hyper interesting question that like i mean con con with other factors kind of led to newton inventing calculus so like if it, if it can get someone to like invent all of calculus that's probably a sign that it's a good question um but outside of that i also think like doing what we can to be pretty empathetic and non-judgmental in the, the moments when someone is like, you know, you, let's say you're, you've got a friend or a student or someone and you're sitting there trying to teach them a thing when you're excited about this. And I like, I do, I, I I'll, okay. I'll, I'll tell you a little story actually. I know I'm going on, but I, I got together the other day with um, a high school friend who was a little bit older than me. And he was recalling the story where he was leading like the math tutoring lab and was in some sense like in charge of the other math tutors. And I was like one of them. And so I think he was a senior and like I was a sophomore at the time. And so we were like getting together for dinner uh, and we hadn't seen each other for like a decade, right? And he's like, you know, I have to say, Grant, I feel like um, something must have changed because what I remember uh, of you back in like teaching, uh, like tut tutoring in high school, ah, but I just remember this one moment where there was this girl that was really struggling with something and, and your explanation, you just looked and said like, well, you just have to think about it. I don't understand how you don't get this. And, and I cringed to think that that would be like what I said, but I don't know, like as a high schooler, I was probably pretty unempathetic and like 
low EQ. Um, but it's it's very easy when you do understand something to um, maybe accidentally say the wrong thing or explain things with a pace that's not acknowledging like where the person you're talking to is. So when you're in that moment of really wanting to share your enthusiasm for the subject or wanting to help someone who's like seeking help, um, I think displaying dramatically more empathy than like the 10th grade version of me evidently was in that moment that <laughs> stuck with this friend of mine for at least a decade so that he could like bring it back and taunt me with it. Um, and I on, honestly, I still find myself doing this sometimes where I get excited about something. And if I'm just like talking to someone, I just go too fast because I'm like excited about it and like want to rush into it. And if it's someone who's communicative, then they say like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, why does this thing follow? Where did this come from? What are we doing? But a lot of people sometimes just like nod along and don't really tell you that they're not following because it's a little embarrassing sometimes. So uh, a mixture of like, make sure that the the strong motivation, maybe from a science and then just really, really bending over backwards to be empathetic in the moment of explaining because it's like, it's it's uncannily difficult. Uh, maybe for the next question, I'll hop um, over to you. Sorry to interrupt. It's just, oh, please. Um, we might have to pick up the pace a little bit, um, not not to be too harsh, um, but uh, our time is unfortunately limited as much as I know people would like to ask you questions all day. Um, but in the interest of having a, a female uh, go, go um, uh, Nalani, if you still have, if you would still like to ask your question and feel free to introduce yourself, introduce yourself. I mean, hello everyone. Um, that was so kind of you, Damien. Yeah, uh, I'm Nalani and I'm from India. So uh, I identify myself as a math enthusiast and it's also because um, I used to challenge my t-shirt and I used to just uh, look at the proofs and you know, like the next day of the class, I used to go and do the proof on the board, like no matter what, just to challenge my teacher. And that's how my interest sort of ignited. And, um, you know, to my peers, math is seen as a very pathetic domain to explore. So how do you sort of simplify to these people that math is not that pathetic? Because it's really fundamental. It's like it's everywhere. It's omnipresent. That's how I see math. And, um, sir, how do you think that you can sort of simplify to that people? That's pretty much my question. Yeah, pathetic is an interesting, uh, interesting word choice there. What, what do you, what do you think they mean when they, when they say pathetic? Like what is, maybe is coming to it's their the mind? Grades. Maybe it's the mm. grades. I don't know. Maybe they're just um, really sad about the grades because I don't think grades do matter because it's about how much you enjoy the domain. It, it doesn't matter. But yeah, how do you simplify to them? Uh, you might have just hit on something good there, which is like if you can do it in a context that's not associated with grades. Like maybe you can be outside the environment where like the stress is induced. So, you know, my life is easy because like if someone's on YouTube, they're opting into everything. I don't ever have like someone coming that hasn't opted into it. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for like infectious enthusiasm and like just hearing you ask the question, it's clear that you really like love the stuff. I think that that level of enthusiasm, if you just like be yourself, as you're describing, that actually probably goes a long way, maybe longer than is easy to give it credit for. Um, and uh, just collecting examples, right? Where the, the things that really, really got you going, like actually keep notes on it. Be like, oh, this is a great example. Maybe I'll, I'll try to bring this up with, with someone next time. Or, oh, th this is really what explains, you know, this seemingly dry algebra concept that a lot of people need to like get over this hurdle. Um, like th th this is a really nice way of, of viewing it. So I'm going to like try to remember to, to use that. Um, and like after a while, you'll have like a, a decent little collection of these things that you can kind of pull out and mix that with your own enthusiasm. And I bet that would go a fair way. Interesting. Um, uh, yeah, the, ca the case against grades, it's a paper mentioned in chat um, uh, by Alfie Khan. Uh, yeah, I was on, I believe. Um, it, it's it's uh, anyone interested in education, uh, reformation, I think, uh, should probably read that paper. Um, uh, could we have, um, could we uh, please have um, Auden's question next, if um, by Zach's proxy? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so. 
Uh, hi, I'm Zachary. I work for Hat Club. Um, I'm going to read a, a question from Alden. He couldn't get his microphone working, um, so I'm going to read it for him. Um, he says, I'm Alden. I'm a freshman in college, and your videos were a really formative part of how I fell um, into what I'm currently studying. I literally remember watching your linear algebra videos as they were released. It was such a wonderful experience, so thank you for that. I've always loved your videos, but I'm curious about the, your thoughts on improving math, um, writing, and textbooks, since I've been trying to write a better calculus textbook. Um, and I'm always interested in ideas about what this might look like. Um, so yeah, that's a question um, yeah, about uh, math literature, especially about te uh, textbooks. I think it's a great question. Um, I've always wanted to basically flip it around where examples usually show up at the end of a chapter uh, or at the end of a section. You know, here's a result. Uh, you know, here's what, here's how, how we prove it. And then here's some examples. Just flipping that, like the, the, the section should always open with a pile of examples that um, have something in common and that thing in common will turn out to be whatever the general like theorem is. Um, but you kind of then go into it knowing what kind of questions they solve or having some canonical example in your mind that you can attach it to. Um, Cause just every time I read a textbook, it's like I read the definition, kind of understand it at a logical level, but like really have, have no picture in my mind for what it means. Um, maybe read some proofs about it or corollaries and it's the same level of fuzziness. And then you see some like examples. If it's a good textbook, they give like a diversity of them. They don't just say like, here's the super trivial case. And then here's another super trivial case. They, they give something that's like relevant outside um, the specific domain of the chapter. And then I'm like, oh, wait, that's what it is. And then I have to go back and read the whole thing again. It's like, if they just put that up front, that would have been helpful. So yeah, just that, that is one, as one thing to focus on, I think could go a long way. Uh, so much. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so thank you uh, very much for that, Grant. Um, could we go on to, let's see, Neil's question? Oh, yeah. Hi. My name is Neil. I'm from the Bay Area, a hacker from the Bay Area. So, um, and my question was just like about the education aspect of it. And like now that people can learn so much through like online education and have access to like so much knowledge. How do you, what do you think is like the next step for schools, especially with like people having different motivations that you, as you've been like talking about in like grades and all of that type of thing? Yeah. Um, I mean, I talked a little before about how it would be really neat to see some sort of experiments in self-pacing go a little further. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious about like the future of college in the sense of like, maybe there's a way that someone can get a really good four year post high school experience that involves like community and self-growth and all the things from college, but that doesn't involve like hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on like something that has questionable vocational implications. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some models out there with like income share agreements that I, I'm just curious about. I think that could make a lot of sense um, where you basically say like, we, we will be teaching you something for free. And like, if you get a job related to it, then for some number of years, like a portion of your income comes back to the school. If you don't, then like it doesn't. And there's like minimums around that. Um, there's a little part of me that kind of wants to see that at all levels, like that the way that a high school teacher is compensated has some sort of like income share with the students, like out to the future. And of course it, it's harder because you have this like separation in time, but it's like home mortgages exist. And that's something where like the, the time when the like money is realized is like 30 years in the future, but like banks are willing to take on that risk. Like, why shouldn't it be the case that you can have income share uh, uh, compensated teachers at like the middle school and high school level? I don't know if it has to be private, but let's just assume it's like a private school that works that way. Um, you know, they, they don't actually get any return on that uh, until like 20 years from then, but because it's a very real asset. And if you like assess if the students are good or not, like some bank could suppose probably like uh, back a loan from that. And if you have that level of incentive alignment in terms of like how one teacher is handing off students to the next year, or if they have some instinct that like, man, you know, there's not a programming curriculum, but that's really important for these students. Maybe I'm just going to teach them a little programming on the side or like incentivizing the really talented people who usually become software engineers or something to come and like teach instead so that it's not just something that you do because you like have a good heart, but maybe there's something remunerative about it because you're just adding so much value. I would love to see that as like a large scale experiment. I have no idea what would go into it, into like making it actually happen. But if someone ever came and said like, yeah, we're doing an ISA high school, I'd be like, whoa, tell me more. I would love to follow. Yeah, thank you. That's super cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there are an increasing number of organizations that are trying to incorporate 
um, that we're trying to use income share agreements as an approach to education. Lambda School is one of them. It was mentioned in the chat by a few people. Um, and I, I'm also really uh, fascinated in seeing where that goes. Um, so uh, could we have Rishi go next? Heck yeah. Um, hey, Grant. I'm Rishi. I'm a hack clubber from Brampton, Ontario, close to Toronto. I'm 15 years old. Um, and this is a question that myself and another hack clubber, his name's Matt, he's um, 17 now from Goffstown, New Hampshire, um, had. We think that there's a general propensity for people to view math research as something that's purely theoretical. You know, you might have an idea, implement it in a paper, write a little bit about it and submit it to a conference where it lies at the back of archive for all time. Um, I think that there's loads of growth um, in terms of places like open source. Um, publishing Manum is a really great example of this. Um, you know, it now has upwards of like 30,000 stars um, and it's impacted so many different people, right? Even though it was originally written as like this one thing to create math videos. Um, so I'm curious as to know how you think building for open source first might change the future of academia um, and research as a whole. You know, how else do you, or what else do you think could be done to um, better help the field communicate? Well, I mean, definitely the idea of anytime that there's like scientific results that what you publish alongside the paper is also code associated with it. I think that can be very interesting. I mean, at least in the context of like pure math, um, it is rather interesting that um, like proof checking software is starting to gain more steam where what it can look like to publish a result could in theory be like publishing code that other people could run. Um, and what you see then is there's like various research mathematicians I've talked to who've never used GitHub, like are never on it at all, but they're like, oh, I've, I've started to like try to learn Git a little bit because of these like projects I'm doing with collaborators uh, that involve using lean, like the certain proof checker. And what that probably has is then a bunch of outsized benefits where simply by getting them on GitHub and like doing something there, then next time they put together some Mathematica notebook for their own work, they're like, oh, I might as well put on GitHub too. And like just sort of having the, um, the gateway drug to like get them uh, started on it might have all of these uh, sort of ancillary benefits. Because um, like, I don't know, I, I started putting Manum uh, up there open source mostly because I wanted some place for it to like live and exist and GitHub's the most convenient and might as well be open source, why not? Like it was just because I had like kind of used it for other projects that there was a level of familiarity. Um, and I think if, you know, every every publication had associated with it that, um, that sort of uh, like contribution, it's not even what you would get from those publications themselves, I guess is what I'm saying, but it's instead like what happens when all the scientists are really comfortable with that as a culture and as a set of tooling. Um, so I don't know if that's a coherent answer other than just like mirroring the the implicit optimism in your question that like seems like a good thing and seems like the world's moving that way and I hope it does so faster. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, there was this one statement in the DeepMind documentary about AlphaGo that really struck me. Um, they were commenting on the fact that like they had all of these reporters all like struggling to get at them at like the final conference in Seoul um, and like that was so out there for people in academia because normally like the norm is literally just you create a neural network and you put it into a paper and that's it, right? Like this sorts of thing where you publicize it in like such an interesting way isn't really something that's super common. Um, so yeah. yeah, much. It's not clear how healthy that is though. <laughs> like there's some things where it definitely is good to have a lot of public attention, but there's sometimes when maybe that just directs your research in ways that, like, you know, is it necessarily the best um, strategy towards uh, general AI to work on games? Like maybe we can make some cases and they'll definitely like make cases there. Maybe not, but it definitely is like very tangible and easy to, for people to like see what it's doing and super measurable. And it makes it so that you can have this like publicity event around it that then helps generate more funding. But it might be the case that if you just had a pure researcher with all the resources they wanted saying like, what's your strategy for this, that they would have painted a completely different road. Um, I don't know. And, and also then there are the other, other distractions that come from popularity in terms of just like where your mind share goes and things. So the benefits of like open source and all of that would, I, I would say would not necessarily be for the publicity side of it, but it would be for just other, uh, other implications for like your own workflow and like how much tooling is at your fingertips when you want to try something new. Yes, totally. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. 
um, yeah, yeah, the decentralization of knowledge. Anyway, um, yeah, so we uh, will need to go over time. It's about it's almost four thirty, but of uh, if if you um, if you'd be willing, um, we more than happy have, to stick around for another yeah. like fifteen minutes or so. So, so uh, Edwin, would you like to go? Also, feel free to introduce yourself. Uh, okay, hello, uh, I am Eduardo. And well, I had two questions. One you kind of already answered. It's regarding uh, that. Well, I see a very clear intersection: uh, math, visual arts, and programming in all of your videos, and also the, the stack and everything. So I wanted to know how did you get kind of into that path? And the other one is, and I think more relevant to us as Hack Club in general. I think there is a very common uh, uh, misconception around STEM subjects, like not only math, but also programming and physics, that they are very hard subjects and very uh, boring uh, in general, in all levels of education. So I, my question was regarding why do you think that is and what can we, uh, not necessarily us, but uh, in general, can make about that? Uh, yeah, so um, those two. Yeah, I guess answering yourself. Well, first of all, I should say, if anyone wants to like leave because it was scheduled as one hour, like I know the feeling of being on a Zoom call like for a little bit longer than you intended, I wouldn't be offended at all. Um, secondly, to the question of, uh, you know, a lot of people seem to view math and physics as hard. Like, what can we do about that? I think it is hard. And like, we shouldn't lie about that. And it might actually be counterproductive to kind of go and say like, oh, everyone like views this, views physics as being really hard. But like, you know, from the right, uh, from the right perspective, it can be easy. It's like, it's definitely the case that you can do things to make it easier or like less hard, but um, just acknowledging that like, it definitely is a challenge. And I think maybe metaphors with like sports can sometimes be helpful here where, you know, if someone wants to get really good at um, like tennis or something like that, like everyone acknowledges that it's quite hard to do so and to become excellent at it. And that because it's hard, it requires a lot of time and maybe very specific kinds of training. Like you want to do, uh, uh, like make sure that you have good leg strength or good reactions or, or what have you. And sometimes the way that the training looks is going to be kind of boring. Like just doing squats is a very boring activity if you just like assess it for what it is, but that it's in the service of something that you want to get great at. Um, like that has a lot of parallels often, often physics where like you, you want to acknowledge to the students that like, yeah, actually some of the time spent to become great at this, it kind of is boring. Like if you're inspired by the broader subject and you say, I really want to know how the world works, or I've seen a couple inklings of beauty that I'm a little bit addicted to, you're willing to push through that boring part because you know it's like developing a good skill and exercising the right muscle. But a fear I have actually with like the implicit message that I might leave in videos sometimes is that like, it's always beautiful because I just like cherry pick the stuff that I really like and that I think, you know, might do well on the platform or might inspire people. And I like just nicely show them these cherry picked lessons of like, oh, you know, what a beautiful proof. Like when, when there's some terrible algebraic slog that's kind of necessary to show that something's true, you know, I slog through it and I'm like, boy, am I never going to make a video on that? Cause that was terrible. Right. But that, that means you have this sort of selection filter for what, what even goes up there. And you know, so to your question of what, what we can do, maybe just like be honest about that fact um, and let people know that when others are really into it, like they're a physicist or they're just a, a student who's really nerdy about it, that it's not because it isn't hard for them or because they don't go through those log parts, but it's sort of in spite of that and that they they seem to have some light at the end of the tunnel that makes them want to like do the metaphorical squats in that context so that when this the person is sitting there slogging through something that is kind of boring or is kind of hard. They don't think like, oh, I must be doing it wrong. Right. And this is actually one thing I quite like about Khan Academy videos is that it's so unedited that sometimes he's just like going, going through something for like 20 minutes. Um, he's like, oh, we got to carry this part over here. You know, this expression is complicated. Maybe we should like spend some time simplifying it. That like makes it kind of boring. But then when you're the student working on the same problem and you're 20 minutes into it, you know, like, oh, this doesn't mean I'm doing it wrong. Like this is how it's supposed to work. And having seen that, like by example, in the form of Sal doing a really unedited video, I think 
has a pretty important place in like this whole sphere of how we communicate stuff. That was a really great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so let's move on to Edwin, Edwin Z, and then we'll move on to Zach and uh, uh, have things fade out a little bit. So um, Edwin, Edwin Z, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Oh, I can't hear you. Still uh, nothing. Edwin? Can other people hear? No, it's not just you. No, we can't hear him. Um, yeah, no, Edwin, check um the audio settings and maybe choose a choose a microphone for your laptop or your computer. Um, Hello? if that Hello? Be necessary. Oh, oh, there you go. All right, got it. Thank you, thank you, Grant. Uh, pleasure honor to speak with you. Um, my name is Edwin. Uh, I run a hack club in the Ottawa area in Canada. Um. I also run competitive programming and uh, competitive math sort of help sort of clubs and uh, we you know we meet once a week for an hour and so my question for you is that like competitive math competitive programming these are like very large fields and it demands like a lot of time right and meeting one an hour a week it, it definitely um, is a limit on how much impact that I can deliver to uh, the, the members of my club so what advice do you have to um, for just delivering the ma that maximum impact um, during that one hour per week? Uh, it would depend on the goal. Like, is the goal to win contests? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, in that case, maybe um, like spending a lot of your prep time coming up with what the best homework is. Like, cause okay, in that one hour, you're not gonna get that much, but you kind of want to give a little bit of a training regimen where you say, okay, mm -hmm. here's like, here's a, a certain set of skills that we want to develop this week, you know, associated with, um, uh, analytic geometry um, and just find some questions that you like, these are really good examples that cumul cumulatively might take like four hours to solve. Um, we can maybe go through one or two examples in our hour, but like go through the rest of these to develop that skill. Uh, and like some of the people will do it. Um, some won't because like, you know, we, everyone has enough homework as it is, but if they're serious right. about doing well, then maybe they do. Um, and then, then maybe in the next week, you can kind of use the time to say like, what were the hardest questions from that? Or where are the weak points? Um, and it's based on then not just what someone was thinking about for like five minutes, but what they'd been thinking about for like a week. Um, and that way you can really get at like what the, the weaker points might be. Um, I think in my own tutoring, I would often not give enough homework. And it was really tempting because of what's most fun to do is just sit down and like talk about math and explain stuff. But what's dramatically more productive is to think about like what's happening outside that one hour. So I like constantly had to kind of remind myself of this fact. Um, but it's hard because um, that means that you have to spend a lot of time yourself curating and finding the right kinds of questions based on the group that you're targeting it to. But uh, that can kind of be fun in its own way if you have a sufficiently large bank of problems to look through. Got it. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, so finally, let's move on to Zach. Zach. Awesome. Um, can y'all hear me? Sweet. Um, well, Grant, first, I just want to say, like, oh my god, what an honor it is to have you take an hour out of your day and spend this with us. Like, really, thank you so much. Like, this is such a gift. I, I really have loved a lot of things that you've said. Like, in particular, I, I loved what you said about how I don't know anything about math, but I, I know some about coding. And I, I love how you said that we shouldn't pretend it's not hard. We just have to figure out how to make it fun. And um, because I know that's really what it was for me when I was learning to code. Because when I was learning, I was like, how the heck does anyone build any of this stuff? There's like a thousand concepts. I don't get any of it. There's like a thousand languages. Like, do I learn Python first? Do I learn Java first? Like, what am I supposed to do? And it wasn't until I started building things and it was almost like I got addicted. Like I didn't want to watch Netflix. I didn't want to watch movies. I was like, all I wanted to do was make things. And suddenly it felt like, you know, there was this path through the forest. So I, I really like that. Uh, it's very motivating. Um, my question is a little bit different. Um, and I, I want you to actually to, to close your eyes. Um, so if you could take a second, close your eyes um, an hour, and 
10 minutes ago, right before you joined this meeting, you open up your email or your calendar and you clicked the, the Zoom link. And I want you to pretend that when you click that Zoom link, instead of Zoom popping up on your computer and putting you in this call with all of us, um, you somehow found yourself teleported back to the year 500 BC. <laughs> you have no idea how it happened. You have no idea how you got there. You don't even know like what laws of the universe allow this to happen, but you open your eyes and it's 500 BC. And every single person around you is treating you like you're the dictator of the world because you are. You realize that you were teleported back to the year 500 BC and somehow you became the dictator of the world. And um, there's, there's a few more details. You all, in addition to realizing that you became dictator of the world, you also realize that you are on one of three identical Earths. And you don't know, you know, what what's going to happen. You don't know how, how it's going to happen, but you do know for a fact, for sure, that in 2,521 years from now, in the year 2021, there is going to be a great war between these three Earths and only one Earth is going to survive. The question is, what do you do as dictator of the world in the year 500 BC to best increase your Earth's chance of survival? And there's, there's three constraints. So are you following so far? I follow so far. This is the most okay. outstanding question I've ever been asked. Go oh, on. Thank you. Um, so the first constraint is you know everything you know today, um, but you can't bring anything back with you and you can't prep anything. Like you only know what you know in this moment, in this instant, and you can't bring anything back. The second constraint is everyone's treating you like you're dictator of the world, but the year is 500 BC and you're limited accordingly. Um, you can assume that, for example, if you say something like, how is that message going to get to the other side of the world before you die? Um, you can assume like you can start anywhere on the planet that you want. Um, you can assume you speak the local language. You can assume you're not going to like die of diseases that no longer exist today that your body is not immune to. Um, but, you know, you're operating those constraints and you only have the rest of your life to set your plans in motion. Um, the final constraint is that... Um, the war is inevitable. You don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know where these other three Earths are. Um, there's no way to prevent it. You can assume diplomacy is not an option. Um, and you have to somehow set your plans in motion before you die. Man. All right. Uh, okay. So it feels like two things are pretty important if you're like setting civilization. It's like you want a culture of, you know, like scientific inquiry. Um, so that people are like building things and, uh, like coming to a true understanding of how the world works faster than the other earths are coming to a true understanding of how the world works. And then the other is like societal stability, um, where I, I don't think dictatorship, like it would, you know, it would be great while I was in charge. Um, but I think I would probably like first things first is we'd want to set up like a, a good system for, um, like how things would be democratic in like a stable way after like I died. Like, I think that would probably be pretty important because, like it's pretty rare that democracies try to take over the world, but it's like not uncommon for dictatorships to try to take over the world. And then that just really sets things back. Um, I mean, the, this is one of those classic situations. I have you ever read a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court? Okay. So you, you would love it based on the question you just asked. Like the first thing you should do when you get off this call is go and read this book because it's just so delightful. It's, um, but it, it's a similar, you know, someone for inexplicable reasons jump, jumps back in time and like establishes his way in the world. Uh, it, it really just shines a light on like, he just knows all these things, like how radio waves work and how to like make one from scratch and all these thought experiments shine a light on like, man, I don't know anything, <laughs> you know, <laughs> someone, you like start trying to explain to the people around you, like, no, there's these things called waves and we can use them for like long distance communication. And the people are like, okay, how do you do it? I'd be like, ah. Boy, I don't know. Do we have any like lodestones that seem to point north? I think I might need one or two of those. Um, I would just be, I think I would be pretty disappointed in how uh, unproductive things were there. But, you know, I would probably try to get a little community like Pythagoras's community of people who are into asking questions about math and like give them a lot of the facts that I did know, a lot of the ways that I do know it relates to the world. Hopefully, trying to like get a little bit of momentum of like, skepticism and inquiry that like persists um, longer thereafter. 
because if you can have like a stable civil civilization surrounding a group that's like inquisitive and skeptical, um, they're probably going to figure out like how the world works and then be able to build stuff. And so like your, your main risk is that the whole civilization around them is like unstable because there's just like constant war or something like that. Um, and boy, boy, am I not the right person to answer that, but uh, democracy feels kind of like the, the most important um, piece of that puzzle. So not necessarily the, the greatest answer to the, the greatest question, but I definitely appreciate the level of detail that went into that. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll mull it over further and, and reach out if I come up with a better answer. I, I love that answer. I've, I've never thought about how, like I've thought about the idea of like, you need to establish some sort of like intellectual community that can really seriously kind of be inquisitive about the world. But I haven't thought about how you need societal stability for that. Um, and I, I think you're really right. I, I think that's really smart. Um, yeah, so sorry, go for it. And like, just how, how do we make sure that like science is never heretical during those like 2,500 mm. years, right? Like, how do you prevent that? Um, I have no idea, but because you, you run with this issue where like the people who know how things work might accidentally, they, they get kind of powerful because they're able to just like do things that others aren't. And then with that, you know, there's an incentive to uh, ostracize them, if not just murder them. Um, and so I, I don't know. It's it's like you're it's like you're building a little cell, right? And it's like yes, you know, the mitochondria is like this really important energy house, but you have to make sure that the cell wall works because if the cell wall doesn't work, then like everything's everything's shot. So like, what's the cell wall that sort of surrounds your your little group of cluster of scientists? Also. If, after you read Con 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 Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, if you haven't read the Foundation series, then definitely read the Foundation series because, like, yeah, that, that, right in the spirit of the question. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Grant. I'm going to kick it back over to Damien to wrap this up, but really, like, this has just been the most incredible gift. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Hack Club, by its very nature, isn't just about up and coming teenage programmers. Hack Club, it is an incredibly diverse community that accommodates all problem solvers and solution creators, not programmers, hackers. We don't just have a fantastic array of software boomerkins, but an awesome community of future mathematicians and scientists that today's AMA helps celebrate. We've been indescribably honored to have you here today, Grant, and we couldn't be more excited to see what more you'll do. Uh, in contributing to online education and math, you know, people young and old around the globe learn and appreciate it. So everybody unmute, let's give Grant a huge thank you for being here today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Really nice to get to know you all. Can we also give Damien a round of applause for being such an incredible host? Oh my God. Awesome. Oh, sorry. Go, go for it, Damien. Thank you uh, so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Grant. Um, yeah, this is just one in a series of uh, incredible AMAs uh, that Hack Club has semi regularly. So. And again, it's, it's really just an indescribable, ineffable honor to have you among our AMA guests. So just thank you again for the joining the time. Awesome. Well, everyone, please feel free to unmute at this point. You're welcome to hang out on the call with everyone. Um, Grant, thank you again. You're welcome to hang out or pop off, whatever you want. Um, everyone, thank you all so much for being here. And, and really, Grant, thanks again for being here. And Damien, thank you again for doing such an incredible job hosting.